Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to another session in Engineering 260. A uh, quick announcement is that the um, second order circuits homework has been extended. It was originally due on Sunday night, and I've pushed that to next Friday at midnight. Uh, I think that's Friday the 13th. Uh, so you have time to um, uh, get through that. We're going to get through a lot more of the content today. And um, you should be, you know, fairly well equipped to start the homework um, after today. So that'll give you more than a week to, to work on it. <clears throat> um, okay, so uh, well, picking up where we left off, we, um, we started the source free series RLC circuit um, last time. And to start our analysis, right, um, we, we began just looking at uh, the behavior of this RLC circuit. We did, a, we did a, a, a loop rule, a Kirchhoff's voltage law loop, and some of the voltages around the circuit, and ended up with uh, you know, a series of voltage drops is all equal to zero. Um, and then putting in for the, uh, the differential and integral operators for the voltage on the inductor and the voltage on the capacitor, we arrived at a second order integro differential equation, right? When, which, which is an equation that has both differential and integral operators in it. Took the derivative of that, that whole expression to get it in to become just a differential equation, that is where there are no integral operators in it. And, um, and then, uh, you know, first derivatives became second derivatives and so on and so forth. And then we put that in standard form where the highest order differential term is in the front and successively lower order terms are um, after that towards the right. And we remind ourselves that the solution to um, any differential equation is a function. Um, so that, that solution for us is I of t is the solution to this thing where you can take some function I of t, scale it, add it to its derivative and scale that, and add it to its second derivative scaled again, and those will all equal zero. And what kinds of functions, you know, probably are good candidates for that are exponential functions because the, the derivatives are also um, exponential functions. So we tried out I of t is equal to A e to the st, and um, therefore then um, D, the first derivative would be S A e to the st, the second derivative would be s squared a e to the s t. And we'll keep that thought in mind as we come back to Laplace variables later. And we can see that you know, taking the derivative of a signal in, a, in the Laplace domain is equivalent to multiplying it by the Laplace variable s. And we'll get to that later. Also, um, taking the integral of a, a signal in the Laplace domain is just uh, equivalent to dividing by s. Um, so we'll see that as we come back. But, Putting in those terms um, for the uh, second derivative, first derivative, and original function into the differential equation, we were able to pull out that a e to the s t, and we got a we got a function that was um, that was a quadratic function in terms of s l s squared plus r s plus one over c, and if that whole thing times this exponential is to equal zero, then the solution is for any time other than t equals um, infinity, is that right? When does this a e to the s t thing become zero? It becomes zero, this a e to the s t thing here becomes zero at t equals infinity. So um, so then the, the you know for all other times, the only way for this to equal zero, remember uh, that is, based on the sum of the voltages around the loop. That's why it's equal to zero. That's why this, this equal zero term is there. Then this quadratic formula must equal zero. And when we set it equal to zero, that's what we call the characteristic equation of the system. Um, and, it's, and specifically, this is for a source-free series RLC circuit system. All right. When we go and do the parallel circuit a little bit later, we'll see that it has a slightly different characteristic equation. Um, but the characteristic equation for the series source-free RLC circuit is this, LS squared plus RS plus one over C equals zero. And, um, and we call it the characteristic equation because 
knowing the roots to that characteristic equation, that is the variable, the values of S that make this equation true, that make it equal to zero, um, just like finding the roots of any quadratic formula, that actually characterizes the system as we're going to finish the discussion for today. We started it last time and I'm gonna walk us through the, get us back up to where we, we left off. So, um, <clears throat> you know, solving for the roots of that characteristic equation, um, which we'll call S1 and S2, um, we can solve that with the quadratic formula and um, plugging in values for, you know, A is L, B is equal to R, and what's usually called C in the quadratic formula is one over the capacitance. And if we plug that all in, we got to this formula here, and then we ended up writing it in a, in a nice concise form where we noticed we had a, a minus R over 2L in the front, and we call that alpha, um, because we also see that R over 2L inside of the radical, um, and so we realized that's alpha squared, and then this minus one over LC, when we wrapped 2L into there, we got a minus one over LC, we call that beta squared. And so we have this nice, in a, in a nice, neat, con concise format. The, the two roots are just negative alpha plus or minus the square root of alpha squared minus beta squared, where you can calculate alpha, um, just knowing the resistance and the inductance. And you can calculate beta squared, knowing the in inductance and the capacitance. Um, we recognized that beta has a, a special significance. Um, it's actually the, the square root of one over LC, the units of that are in radians per second. And um, that's actually the undamped uh, or natural frequency of the system, the undamped frequency or the natural frequency. Um, <clears throat> and it's the frequency at which this system would oscillate if there were no energy lost. So we talked about a mass bouncing back and forth on a spring. If it bounced that way forever and never lost energy, um, it would do so at a rate um, that is equal to omega naught or, or B or beta. Okay. Um, similarly, for an inductor capacitor circuit that just oscillated back and forth forever and had no resistive dissipative element, um, it would do so at a rate omega naught or uh, also termed beta. So, um, <clears throat> Now, uh, then we started to look at, so, so, so getting to this point, we realized that the, this is the care, this knowing the roots tells us how the system is going to behave. And it turns out the system behaves in pretty much three different ways. As long as there's some damping, the system responds in three different ways. Um, overdamped, critically damped, and underdamped. Last time we left off, we, do, we looked at the overdamped case. And that's the case when the value under the radical is positive. Um, in other words, alpha squared is bigger than beta squared. Um, and so we get real and distinct roots, right? Because this is negative alpha, that's a real number, plus some other real number. If, it's, if the value under the radical is positive, that's a real number, right? Um, and so negative alpha plus some real number just gives you one of the poles, which we showed here in the complex plane. Remember, we're going to be drawing these things, the roots um, uh, or the poles of the system in the complex plane. Um, and, um, and so that's S1 is equal to negative alpha plus, you know, root alpha squared minus beta squared. That's just some real number, and it's shown as marked on the real axis. Um, the other root is S1, or I'm sorry, negative alpha minus root alpha squared minus beta squared, which just shows up over here. That's S2. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and we recognize that th you'll have the critically damped, or I'm sorry, the overdamped case um, when the resistance, the dampening um, sort of player in this on the stage here, has more. Um, higher magnitude than um, the uh, root four over root four L over C. And remember L and C are the things that can store energy and they're the things that take time to uh, respond. Okay, and so when you when you have an overdamped system, you calculate the poles so you can, so as you'll see shortly, we're gonna do some example problems, but alpha is just calculated by R and L, right? It's R over two L. <clears throat> 
Uh, beta squared is just one over LC. So once you know both of those components, those are just numbers, um, uh, then you can calculate the poles, S1 and S2, or the roots to the characteristic equation. I'll, I'll come back later to talk about why we call them the poles of the system. But for now, um, just know that I'm going to be using that terminology. They're called the system poles, and um, which is another way to say the roots of the characteristic equation. Okay, you'll hear them referred to in both of those contexts, um, both in this class and as you move into later courses. So um, we'll start to use that terminology. Okay, and that's and this gives you the overdamped response. And this looks something like that. If you if you take a look, this is it turns out this is the solution i of t. This is the function that is the solution to the differential equation. This guy here, um, if the system is overdamped. And so if the system is overdamped, which you find out by looking at the values of the poles, S1 and S2, then you know that the solution is A1 e to the S1t and A2 e to the S2t. That's the solution to that differential equation. And that's the function, that's what the current will look like in that system. Um, the values of A1 and A2, we'll see how to solve for those momentarily. Um, but S1 and S2 are really easy to calculate. You just find out the values of alpha and beta, which are based on the system components, R, L, and C. And then you calculate the poles, S1 and S2, and you have those. And then we'll talk about how to find A1 and A2. But before we move on to look at the next two cases, the under underdamped case and the critically damped cases, um, let's just point out that these the function, what, what does it look like? Let's think about... Um, you know, the graphical representation of these two exponentials added together. As we'll see, one of them is, um, well, S1 and S2 are both negative numbers, actually, um, because they're both here on the left-hand plane of the complex plane, right? They're both uh, lower than zero on the real axis. So, so these are actually both exponential decays. Um, <clears throat> A1 and A2 could be positive or negative. Um, and we'll see how that happens. But when you add these two exponents together, you kind of get a rising phenomenon and then a, and then a drop off phenomenon. And it could go positive like this. It could go you know, negative downwards and then come back to zero. But it looks like this kind of little bump. And um, the reason it looks that way is because you're adding two um, exponentially decaying functions together. <clears throat> okay, it's we call it overdamped because it is much more damped than what we'll see shortly is called a critically damped um, system, uh, which we'll talk a little bit about why it's called critically damped. Okay, so that brings us up to speed. And um, at this stage, let's now then um, go and explore the next case which is the, um, <clears throat> the underdamped case. Oh, whoops, um, hang on a second. Okay, so, uh, so case two, case two for us is when alpha squared minus beta squared is less than zero. Okay, remember that's that alpha squared minus beta squared term is the um, is the value under the radical. So if it's less than zero, then S1 and S2 are complex. And it actually it turns out that they're complex conjugates. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Let's calculate what uh, they would look like. So if we plug in the values for S1 and 2, remember it's always negative alpha plus or minus the square root of alpha squared minus beta squared. Um, now let's go ahead and realize that alpha squared and beta squared are actually um, less than zero. So one of the ways we could actually write this is, is as follows. We'll, we'll show it like this, negative one times, not alpha squared minus beta squared, but beta squared minus alpha squared, right? All we've done is rearrange the order of those two things and pull out a negative one. Um, 
And when we recognize that, we see that we can write this in a way where this is negative, negative alpha plus or minus uh, the square root of negative one times what we are going to term omega d. All right. Um, <clears throat> now, omega d is the damped frequency. Um, <clears throat> omega d, if we write this this way, omega d squared is equal to beta squared minus alpha squared. Um, <clears throat> and um, we refer to as omega d as what, what is called the damped frequency. Okay, now it's 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 not the undamped frequency. Remember, omega naught is the undamped frequency. Omega d is the damped frequency, um, in which, as you're about to see, so if a, if you if you bounce a mass on a spring and the mass oscillates forever, that's what's called undamped motion. It never decays. No energy is ever lost, and it would do so at the rate omega naught. Um, the undamped frequency. Now, if you bass, uh, bounce a mass on a spring and it and it you know it's it's got a lot of amplitude at first and then it comes down and it has less and less amplitude. Um, at uh, we we say that that system has damping. Then it's losing energy through each oscillation, and and it turns out that the rate at which it's oscillating up and down is less than it would be if there were no damping at all. And that rate we refer to as the damped frequency or the damped rate. Um, and um, it's, it's numerically equal to, and we give it the symbol omega D, the D for damping. Okay, so what we can do is then write um, the roots S1 and two in terms of negative alpha plus or minus uh, J, which is the square root of negative one um, times omega D. Um, and that is the, those are the poles for the um, underdamped response. Uh, <clears throat> now, um, if you're looking at this and you're saying, oh, how, what, what are we, why are we using the vari variable J? Um, J, we use in, in circuits and electronics, uh, we use J for the imaginary number, the square root of negative one, uh, so, those, so as to not confuse with um, the other complex variable you've seen in algebra and other mathematics courses, it's often used I, I for imaginary, right? Uh, but we use I all the time for current in electronics. So to, to avoid confusion, um, electrical engineers and anyone working in electronics um, with such operators uses, uses um, with, with complex math uses the variable J. All right, so, um, so this, these are the poles for, um, for the underdamped um, what and what that means too by the way is that there's oscillation as you're about to see it's the underdamped response and s1 and s2 are complex conjugates because one of them is S or is negative alpha plus J omega D. And the other one is negative alpha minus J omega D. So if we look at that in the complex plane, um, here's the imaginary axis and here's the real axis. Let's mark on our complex plane where negative alpha and omega D are. So here's negative alpha. And here's plus J omega D, right? If it's right, if it's if it's J, that's a that's a unit vector up on um, the uh, imaginary axis, right? Um, and it, omega D multiplies it by that, so that's plus J omega D uh, there and minus J omega D here, right? Remember every every number um, in the complex plane. If it's purely real, it's on the x-axis. If it's purely imaginary, which is the case for j omega d, it's on the imaginary axis, right? And then in general, 
any complex number that has both a real part and an imaginary part sits somewhere in one of the first, second, third, or fourth quadrants. Okay, um, so what do the poles look like? Well, they sit at negative alpha plus j omega d, that's S1, and negative alpha minus j omega d, that's S2. Okay, that's that's what the poles look like. That's where that's what they're where where their location is. All right, so then let's go ahead and take a look at um, what would the solution look like. What is the function i of t that is the solution to the differential equation when the roots to the characteristic equation, or in other words, the poles, are complex conjugates, and and we have the underdamped response. So let's go ahead and put, plug it in. So I of t, as we said, is a e to the s t. Okay. Um, now s, the variable, is it turns out has two two values, right? It's s one and s two. So it's we're going to write this in as a one e to the s one t plus a two e to the s two t. Okay, and um, we've just determined that for a um, you know for the for the overdamped system, which we saw on the last page, s1 and s2 were just real numbers, right? They lived on the real axis and they didn't have any complex components. Um, on the underdamped system, you know, when there's not enough damping in here, which we'll see what well, it's basically if it's underdamped, then it's kind of like R is less than this whole term over here. That's that's what determines if there's not enough damping in the system. Okay. Um, so when R is less than um, root 4L over C, the system is underdamped. Um, and when it is underdamped, we know that the poles of the system or the characteristic roots are complex conjugates. So when we plug those values in, we'll see that we're going to get a one e to the um, minus alpha plus j omega um, j omega d times t plus a two e to the minus alpha minus j omega d times t, right? All we're doing is plugging in the values for s1 and s2. And um, what we can do here is recognize that there's a common term. There's an e to the minus alpha t in both of these terms, right? Um, so we can actually pull that out. You'll remember that e to the a plus b is equal to e to the b, e to, I'm sorry, it's equal to e to the a times e to the b, right? You remember this? e to the a plus b is equal to e to the a times e to the b. That's one of the rules of, of exponents. So we can actually pull out the, um, the e to the negative alpha t term out of there, okay? Um, and so we'll have this response. It'll look like this. Uh, we get an e to the minus alpha t times a1 um, e to the plus j omega dt plus a2 e to the minus j omega dt. Okay. We're getting, you know, deep into exponential ter ter uh, territory here with, um, you know, exponents that are imaginary vectors in the complex plane rotating at a certain speed. Wait, what did I just say? What is this thing right here? This e to the e to the j omega t. What in the world is that? Right? You know, when I say e to the minus two t. You can probably visualize what that function looks like in time, right? Right. It's just a e to the minus two t. It looks like it starts out at you know, well, I guess two at t equals zero, and then it exponentially drops off as it gets toward, um, or maybe it's going to go this way. It exponentially drops off as as it gets toward um, t equals infinity. Right. That's an easy thing to visualize. What in the world? Is an exponential function where the ex e to the where the exponent in e to the is imaginary 
and supposedly has some frequency component to it, right? Like J omega D, I am not writing this very clearly. There we go. Um, omega D times T. Well, let's think about what that means, okay? Um, and to help us think about what that means, we're going to ask for a little help from our friend Euler or Euler, however you like to pronounce it. Recall Euler's um, law or rule or whatever it is. Um, <clears throat> e to the e to the j theta. So if you have a, a a variable in the complex plane, right? So let's just imagine you have you have something like this, right? Or let me let me write it like this. So here's the complex plane. E to the j theta um, by Euler's uh, rule, you can um, write this as cosine of theta plus j sine theta, right? Let's remember what that graphically means in the complex plane. So if you have um, e to the j theta, this looks like this, e to the j theta. And then we say that then these components, this is, what is that? That's j sine theta. And then um, this term here is cosine of theta, right? Okay, so um, so hopefully you, you remember that from um, uh, looking at complex numbers and Euler's um, rule or uh, relationship or whatever it's called. I'm, I don't know why I'm blanking on what it's called. Is it Euler's law, Euler's rule? I forget. Um, <clears throat> if you remember, please type it into the chat and help me remember. <laughs> Um, so, so that's what it is for a single position, an angular position, right? Where this is, this is theta, right? Okay. Um, now if, if that works for an angular position in the complex plane, what if we took that vector, this e to the j theta, and instead we let it, um, rotate around at a frequency omega d and and we call that omega d in radians per second right um <clears throat> you recall from angular dynamics or angular motion angular kinematics that um that the angle at any time t of something rotating um, in space, just in general, is equal to the rate at which it's rotating in, 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 um, in radians per second times time, right? Any, you know, so, you, so any position theta right here like this, if you wanted to know where something is as it's rotating through, uh, you know, rotating in general. So things just spinning around like this tape measure, just spinning around. If it's spinning at a constant speed and you want to know what angle, let's say the, the tape is, is making um, with the, hor the hor horizon or something like that, as long as you know the speed at which it's happening and the time at which it occurs, you can calculate or you can find the angle at any time. Um, it's just equal to that rate omega um, times the time. Okay. That's just like a you know, the rotational version of, of um, you know, distance equals rate times time, right? Okay, so when we look back at um, the expression that we have in, um, in these terms over here, e to the j omega d times t, that in fact is a rotating angle in the complex plane. And we can use Euler's law here that says, um, uh, or Euler's formula or whatever it is, um, omega, we can replace that. Remember that omega, any omega is just equal to um, 
or I'm sorry, any theta, sorry, any theta is just equal to the rate at which it's spinning times time. So when you plug that in for Euler's identity, that's what it's called. It's called Euler's identity. Um, we finally rem remembered Euler's identity. Uh, if you plug theta in, omega t in for theta, you get e to the omega, um, I'm sorry, this should be actually, uh, yeah, oh, that's right. Um, e to the, there's the j, e to the j omega t is equal to cosine of omega t plus j sine omega t. All right. So now, if we put that in there, so what we're going to do on the next page is actually put that in for the these complex exponentials here, e to the j omega t. If you're like most people and, and like me, that's kind of hard to visualize what that looks like as a, as a signal in time, OK? Because we don't think in the complex plane. We are beings who live in, uh, you know, a, a four-dimensional universe with time and one time dimension and three spatial dimensions. Complex dimensions don't come easily to us. Um, you know, visualizing how things behave in complex dimensions doesn't really come easily easily to us. So, if we then use Euler's identity and actually replace these complex exponentials e to the j omega t with their Euler identity counterparts, cosine of omega t, well, hey, that's that's a real function. That's a real sinusoid. Plus j sine omega t, hmm, well, that's a complex sinusoid, but at least I can think about what that means a little bit better. And it turns out that even j sine omega t, even though it has that j operator and it's kind of complex, it turns out that that has a real component also. Um, which I'll try to illustrate a little later. Um, and, and the real part of that is a real sinusoid. Okay, so essentially this complex ex exponential e to the j omega t is actually two sinusoids, um, two real sinusoids added together. And we'll see um, how that uh, unfolds on the next page. So if you're feeling like this part is like a lot of math, it, it, it is. Um, there's a lot of complex math and kind of we're breaking out some trig and some trig identities, which we're about to do in a second. And we're also talking about what is the physical significance of this stuff. Um, and I think that that is sometimes overlooked in some, um, you know, some textbooks or, you know, lectures that said, you know, it's easy to just look at the math and say, well, that's the math. But to really think about what is the meaning of like a complex uh, exponential, I think it, I think it behooves us to do so. Okay, um, so let's go ahead and um, pick up from uh, where we were, where we, we had that I of T, um, we, we just arrived that it's equal to E to the minus alpha T times A1 E to the plus J omega D times T. Uh, you know what, I'm just going to leave off the omega D and we're just going to write it as omega because we're going to write omegas a whole bunch of places all, all over the place here in a second. And it's just easier for us to do this. So just as a little reminder, omega, we're now just using omega to write omega D. Okay. So just, just as a little reminder there. Um, so it's e to the minus alpha T times A1 e to the plus J omega T plus A2 e to the minus J omega T. Um, and now that we've talked about the fact that Euler's identity is going to allow us to write e to the plus j omega t as cosine omega t plus j sine um, omega t, and e to the minus j omega t, we can write that as cosine omega t minus j sine omega t. Um, <clears throat> we can now plug those in to our um, equation and um, and we'll get uh, we'll get towards seeing this what what this function is doing in the time domain. Okay, so let's start. <clears throat> 
Um, we're going to start all the way off to the left to give ourselves lots of room because this ends up becoming a pretty long formula for a little while, and then we'll and then we'll simplify it. So we still have our e to the minus alpha t term out in the front, and um, now what we're going to do is let's see. We've got an a one times a cosine omega t term here, and we have an a two times cosine omega t t term here. So we can actually write this as a1 plus a2 times the cosine of omega t, right? And that takes care of these two terms here and the a1 and the a2 term on that. All right, now we can add to that. We need to take care of the j sine omega t terms here. So we've got an a1 times j sine omega t here. And we've got an a2 times negative j sine omega t here. So we could actually write that as a1 minus a2 um, times j sine omega t. OK, we're getting closer to things that just are regular signals in time that we, we know what this looks like. OK. Um, <clears throat> Now, to help us, um, you know, a1 plus a2 is just some number, right? So let's call this a new name. Let's call it b1. And a1 minus a2 is just some other number. Let's give it a new name. Let's call it b2, all right? Those are just coefficients. And that'll make this a little bit uh, more simple for us. So here's, we can write i of t now as e to the minus alpha t times, um, b1 cosine omega t plus b2, um, sorry, this should be a j b2 uh, sine omega t, OK? Now, momentary, so, so, so almost this is looking like if you just sort of ignored the j b sine omega t term, just looking at this, that is a, an, an exponentially decaying sinusoid, which you've probably seen in another mathematics class at some point. And it's easy to visual, well, we'll draw it in a second, but it's easier to visualize what that is in time. Once you throw the J stuff in there, I find that you know, a lot of times, and myself included, it's hard to visualize what, what is that? How, is, how does that signal look like in time? Um, as it turns out, let me just draw this for a second and I'll, I'll, um, I'll erase it in a minute, but um, I'd like for you for a moment to just think through what a rotating sinusoid in the complex plane looks like. So here is, if I took a um, value, JB2 would look like this, okay? So here's, here's JB2, it looks like something like that. Here's JB2, okay? That's what that scalar look, or complex number looks like in the complex plane. If I then take that and I multiply it by sine of omega t, what I've just done is told that vector in the complex plane to now start to rotate at a rate of omega radians per second. It is going to cover omega radians per second. If it's two pi, it rotates around um, the entire complex plane if omega is 2 pi, it, it makes one full rotation in one second, right? That's what that term means, OK? Now, let's draw it again, OK? So that's what a, a rotating sinusoid in the complex plane is, right? Um, so let's draw it again. But this time, I'm going to draw it like this. OK, here's that phaser. Let's say we drew it at an arbitrary time t. Here's J B2 sine of omega t, keeping in mind that this is rotating around at a rate omega, right? Now, let's talk about this. At any time t, this vector has a real component. I suppose I should actually draw that like on a pole. Like, how about like this? It has a real component, and that real component is equal to um the projection of whatever whatever it is at theta it has a it has a real component this 
right here is a real sinusoid. That thing is going to oscillate back and forth on the real axis, um, going from here shrinking down to zero as, as the vector rotates up to 90 degrees and then going all the way back to here. And that, that, that thing is going to rotate back and forth in the imaginary plane. I feel like I have a slide of this somewhere in some notes somewhere. Yeah, I think it's in a later, it's on a later chapter. We'll see this in a later chapter. So I'll show you this diagram in a later chapter, but just suffice to say for now that even, you know, complex sinusoids with that J operator on them have a, um, a real component. Okay. It's a real sinusoid. So if that isn't quite fully comfortable, comfortable, um, one of the things that we can um, we can uh, do is rewrite this the formula over here, this B1 cosine omega t plus JB2 sine omega t. We can actually combine that into a single real sinusoid at a specific phase. Okay? Um, so if you were to consider... Um, you know, in the complex plane, let's say you had, um, let's say you had B1 and B2 as two different vectors in the complex plane, right? So B1 times cosine omega t is on the real axis. JB2 is on the imaginary axis. So we've drawn it pointing upward. Then there is a, a vector that is the sum of those things by adding them together. And we'll just call it, we'll say that it has the, um, we'll call that vector B. Um, uh, remember B1 and B2 are constants. And so the, the magnitude of B, uh, the vector B, is just equal to by Pythagorean theorem, B1 plus B2. And the angle, uh, actually let's not call it theta, let's call it phi. Um, the angle phi is just equal to the inverse tangent of B2 over B1. That's just um, you know standard trig that I think you guys are pretty familiar with by this point. Okay, so if you write it in those terms, you can actually take this whole expression here, B1 plus J, you know that whole thing, and actually write it as um, a different form like this, where it's e to the minus alpha t times, um, oh, sorry. Uh, um, well, you could write it like this. It would be like e to the minus alpha t, I'm going to erase this in a second, times, this would be b times the cosine of omega t plus phi. Okay. Um, that's Another way that you could write this, um, I'm actually going to pull the value B out. So these two things are equivalent here, right? This whole, um, th this B, hang on a second here. Why can't I erase this? Okay, there we go. This whole term is, you can rewrite it as one single sinusoid at a, um, uh, at a um, different amplitude in a different phase. Oh, thank you. I, I was told in the chat, I forgot to write on the uh, squared terms in here um, <clears throat> in the um, Pythagorean theorem. Thank you so much. Um, so what I'll also do is rewrite this with the B out on the front of the exponential term here. So we'll see it like this. This will be um, B E to the minus alpha T times the cosine of um, omega t plus phi. And that is the underdamped response for, it's the response for an underdamped system. Um, and what's nice about the second form, we wrote it down here, is that this has no imaginary operators in it. And you can actually pretty clearly see um, what that's going to look like. Uh, if we were to draw a graph of I of T, whoops, that wasn't a very straight line. Okay, so here's I of T. Um, <clears throat> what this function is going to look like is 
Um, what does this look like? B to the minus alpha T, that's an exponentially decaying um, envelope, okay? So it is an envelope that looks um, kind of like this. Okay, that's what that function looks like. Now, if you're um, multiplying that by a, uh, so it's gonna start out with the value B, right? Um, right there. And then it's gonna exponentially decay uh, towards zero, right? Now, um, if you flip that and essentially view it as an envelope that is then controlling the gain of this whole um, sinusoid, this cosine omega t plus phi, I'm going to draw a cosine wave that's been shifted a little bit. So we'll, we won't start it right here like this. We'll actually start it um, a little bit off phase. And all you're seeing here is that that cosine wave is going to be, the amplitude of it is controlled by the envelope, the exponentially decaying envelope. Okay, so it has a constant uh, frequency, which I did my best to try to draw it as, as having a constant period. And um, it has a phase offset phi, right? So if you wanted to see what that looks like, here's the, the phase offset phi. Um, and then, you know, the uh, omega value is here. This is, this is gonna be T is equal to, what is it? Two pi over omega, is that right? or omega over two pi, it's radians per second. Uh, no, it's two pi over omega, right? I think that's it, right? <clears throat> um, and so, um, so that's what the system response looks like. <clears throat> And just as a reminder, we'll, we'll draw what the complex plane looks like, the, the poles for the system. So I want you to have these pictures together in your mind. Like, so when you see this exponential, this, this underdamped response where let's, we'll talk about that in a second, but it's actually oscillating. Um, but I want you to have in, you know, group together with that in your mind, the complex plane. On the imaginary versus real axes, you have, we already drew this a second ago, but here's minus, um, minus alpha, here's plus J omega, and here's minus J omega. <clears throat> um, and the poles for the system are here, is S1, that's negative alpha plus J omega, and here's S2, that's negative alpha minus J omega. Right, so have those two pictures together in your mind, group them together in your mind. Um, the poles, when they look like that, when they're complex conjugates, you actually get this underdamped oscillating response. Um, let's for a moment, just look at this, look at this function, look at I of T, this is the solution to the differential equation. In other words, that's how the circuit's gonna respond when the system is underdamped. Okay, contrast that with what it looked like when it was overdamped. This just kind of rose up for a minute and then decayed back down to zero. There's no oscillation at all, right? The functions themselves are just exponentials, real exponentials. It wasn't until we looked at an underdamped system, which you know is underdamped by way of the um, you know the radical being negative. Um, remember that the damping there's there's less than r is less than this root four L over C kind of, that's the parameter, right? Um, <clears throat> so, um, so with that, there's not enough damping in the system and it actually, instead of, um, you know, just rising up and then coming back down, it actually rises up and then it has so much extra energy. There's a, there's a trade-off between the energy stored in the capacitor and the inductor and they're sort of handing energy back and forth to one another where there's so much sort of, you know, electric momentum that it actually comes back and swings all the way through zero and goes negative for a while and then, you know, comes the other way and swings back through zero and so on and so forth. It's equivalent to if you just push a little bit down on a spring and there's a lot of stiffness in the spring, right, on a mass, 
there's a lot of stiffness, there's a lot of damping, it's over damped, then the mass is as you expect, if there's a lot of stiffness, it's just going to raise back up and it won't even oscillate. Now, if you take that same mass and you put it on a, a spring with much lower stiffness, like a slinky kind of thing. And um, now if you push down on it, um, this thing might in fact start to go into oscillation until it eventually dies down. It's because you've reduced the system, the stiffness or the, or the um, energy dissipation to a point where the, it actually goes into oscillation. And that's called the underdamped response. So um, super important to know about this and be able to you know, work through the mathematics a little bit on it, um, at least understand the, um, you know, the solution here that this is an exponentially decaying sinusoid because as it turns out, so many things have an underdamped response, buildings, bridges, um, you know, uh, electric circuits, mechanical systems, the, the suspension on a bike or a car. Uh, you know, uh, certain uh, temperature control systems, the, uh, uh, the movement of a robotic manipulator arm might not go exactly to this position, but it might in fact go to that position and then ring a little bit and oscillate a little bit until it settles down to zero. So many things in, um, in you know, uh, natural um, physical systems have a second order response and so many things in engineered um, systems like control systems, temperature and position and speed controllers can have a second order response or, uh, you know, an underdamped response, or it could be overdamped or critically damped, as we'll see. Okay, um, <clears throat> so moving forward, let's, um, let's take a look at um, a, a special case in case two. Um, and, and so when case two is the underdamped case, right? Um, and in that case, we had that R was less than root 4L over C. But um, we have a special case within that um, where R is equal to zero, um, or rather that, uh, let me write it this way, that, th that alpha equals zero. And how is alpha going to be equal to zero? It would be if the resistance was equal to zero. Recall that alpha is equal to R over 2L. So if you let that resistance be zero, then um, alpha is zero. And um, if you have that kind of uh, scenario, which by the way, does not happen in naturally in nature, there's always some kind of energy lost in the system. <clears throat> um, we get what's called the undamped um, response. And um, S1 and two, you know, uh, where they, remember they, they always equal negative alpha plus or minus uh, the square root of alpha squared minus beta squared. That's always true. Um, but in this case, they would be, if alpha is zero, they're just equal to plus and minus J omega D. Um, remember that omega is equal to, uh, in this case, it would actually be equal to beta which is one over LC and that omega would actually tend towards omega naught. It would become omega naught and would oscillate at the undamped frequency. If we look at the complex plane, the poles in the complex plane here, um, what that would look like. So here's the imaginary and real axis. Here's plus J omega. Um, here's minus J omega. And if alpha is zero, um, because the resistance is zero, there's no real component in here. And the poles lie directly on the imaginary axis, okay? It turns out that for any, for any system, um, when the poles lie, and the system poles lie on the imaginary axis, there's no damping. Um, <clears throat> and uh, if you were to look at the graph of I of T, I versus T, oops, hang on here. You would see um, just a cosine of, you know, um, constant frequency, okay? With no damping. All right, so that's a special case. Um, so notice what happens between those two cases, right? When there's damping, 
it's the damping is determined by the resistance, which is in the alpha term. And that moves these poles further towards the negative um, real axis or further negative on the real axis. As those poles start to move towards the imaginary axis over here, um, and when they finally equal the J omega, they're having, there's less and less damping in the system. Uh, so at finally to a point where you actually get um, undamped system response. Now, just conceptually, uh, we won't go into it, but let me ask you a question. What do you think would happen if the real component of the poles of the system starts to go into a positive value? When we used to have exponential decay over on the negative, uh, with negative real and on the real axis of alpha is negative, we had damping. If we have positive real numbers with alpha, you have what you might expect exponential growth and a tiny perturbation in the system, like a tiny os spurious oscillation will continue to grow in the system until the system fails. Uh, <clears throat> and so uh, those are generally bad places you want to be. You want to design systems that don't have poles in the, in the right hand um, side of the complex plane. Okay, and you'll talk about that in structural analysis classes and system dynamics classes and stuff like that. All right, let's finally look at case number three, um, <clears throat> which is when uh, S1 and S2 are real and coincident. So case three, S1 and S2 are real. Um, and ah, um, what's called coincident. What that means is that they're equal. All right, so um, what, where does that happen? So here's S1 and two. It is always equal to negative alpha plus or minus the square root of alpha squared minus beta squared. Um, but in this case, alpha and beta are equal. Okay, uh, we get that the two poles are have equal value at negative alpha. So if you looked at that in the complex plane, um, this looks like as follows. Here's the imaginary and real axis. And they would both have a value at minus alpha. Oops, hang on here. Um, where this would be S1 and S2. So S1 and S2 together. <clears throat> um, at same same spot. Uh, when does that happen? We call this the critically damped response, which we looked at in comparison to the overdamped response. Okay, so if alpha, this happens when alpha squared minus beta squared is zero, or in other words, when alpha uh, squared is equal to, well, if we just wrote it in terms of the values, this would be R over 2L squared, that's what alpha is, is equal to one over LC, or in other words, when R, uh, which we'll call the critically damping resistance is equal to exactly the value 4L over C, <clears throat> okay? Without going in through the, the whole derivation, what you're gonna find when the, when the roots are real and coincident, you get that um, I of T is equal to A1 E to the S1 T plus A2 T E to the S2 uh, T, but S1 and S2 are both equal to, so S1 is equal to S2 is equal to negative alpha. Oops. Um, so uh, if you plug that in, you'll get that I of T is equal to E to the minus alpha T times A1 plus A2 T. And this is the formula that you'll use for um, the critically damped um, response. Okay, so 
Let's take a moment then to summarize everything that we've just learned and then we'll do an example problem. All right, so if we look at the characteristic equation roots, and we then look at the system poles, and we look at the type of response, and then let's also look at a graph of uh, the function, right? So for S1 and S2, are um, real and distinct. Um, I should have given myself more room to draw the poles. So let's do that. Okay, we have the poles look like this. So here's the um, here's negative alpha, and then here's S1 and S2. Right, S1 is here, S2 is there. Um, on the imaginary and real axes. And the response is overdamped. Okay, um, and we know that the function then is I of t is equal to a1 e to the s1 t plus a2 e to the s2 t. And the graph looks like this. I of t, and it looks kind of like lazily comes up and then drops back down to, to zero. Or maybe it's a little bit more like, like that, something like that. OK. <clears throat> um, now, when S1 and S2 are real and coincident, that means that they have the same location on the imaginary axis or on the complex plane. So they both live at minus alpha. There's S1 and two on the imaginary and um, real axes. We have the what's called the critically damped um, response. And um, as we just saw on the last slide, the response is e to the minus alpha t times a1 plus a2 t. And if you look at the graph for that, i of t looks like, well, let me try to line this up actually with the last one. So if we line it up here. This is i of t. It's going to rise up faster than the overdamped response. So it's it, you get a, a quicker response time. <clears throat> OK. Um, and finally, for S1 and 2 are complex. In fact, they're complex conjugates. You have um, what we saw a moment ago, then the in the complex plane, here's minus alpha, and here's plus j omega and minus j omega. And the poles live here. There's S1, then here's S2 at negative alpha minus j omega. Um, and we say that that's the underdamped response. And um, <clears throat> you can write that a couple of ways. You can write it like this. I of t is equal to, um, what was it? It was e to the minus alpha t times b1 uh, cosine omega t plus j b2 sine omega t. Or you can write it as, um, I of t is equal to, what is it? It's um, beta b or b e to the minus alpha t times um, cosine of omega t plus phi. 
right? And then the response type looks like this, I of t, like that, and it looks like an exponentially decaying sinusoid. That's what this looks like. Um, <clears throat> we can also write in here that uh, the values for B and B1 and B2 are all related like this, that um, uh, B is equal to the square root of B1 squared plus B2 squared, and phi is equal to the inverse tangent of B2 over B1. All right, so that summarizes all of the different response types we've looked at. So let's then start um, an example problem. Okay, here's a circuit that um, we've been given. It's a series RLC circuit. Um, and we've been told the values of uh, the, these components here. This is um, R is four ohms, um, L is one Henry, um, and this says F, that should say C is equal to one, farad, one third of a farad. And we've been told that the initial current through the inductor is zero and the initial voltage across the capacitor is five volts. So the first thing to do is to find out um, step number one is what kind of response is this? Is it critically damped? Is it over damped? Is it under damped? Okay, um, to do that, just go ahead and calculate what the poles are. Right, so S1 and 2, if we look at what the poles of the system are, in other words, the roots of the characteristic equation, we'll know based on what type, if they're real and distinct, you know, uh, if they're real and coincident, or if they're complex conjugates, whatever we get, we'll know which type of system we're dealing with and can then um, go to find out the coefficients we need to figure out the solution. So we'll plug in the values. This is minus R over 2L. Um, plus or minus the square root of R over 2L um, squared minus um, 1 over LC. Okay, um, and remember that uh, alpha is R over 2L and beta, we can rewrite these terms in beta squared is um, one over LC. So if we actually just calculate what these things are, um, we can go ahead and find um, the, uh, we can find the roots pretty easily. So alpha is, um, well, it's R over two L. So that's four over um, two times one Henry, which is uh, two and beta, is um, or beta squared rather is one over LC. So that's one over um, L is one and C is one third of a farad, uh, which is equal to three. So we could then jump to just looking at S1 and two in terms of alpha. This is negative alpha plus or minus the square root of alpha squared minus beta squared. Or this is negative two plus or minus the square root of two I'm sorry, alpha squared is four because alpha is alpha's two minus three. Okay, so this is negative two plus or minus the square root of one, right? Um, and the square root of one is one. So this is S1 and two are negative two minus one would be, um, or negative two plus one would be negative one and negative two minus one would be negative three. Aha, we found S1 and N2, they are real and distinct. Okay, so, um, so these are real and distinct. Um, so we have the overdamped response type. Okay, so now that we know it's overdamped, we can go to finding the um, coefficients in the system. So we know it's overdamped. And so the function then is um, I of T is equal to A1 E to the S1 T plus A2 E to the S2 T. And we've just found the values of S1 and S2, 
um, so that is equal to, um, so I of T is then equal to A1 E to the S1 is negative one. So we get an E to the negative T plus A2. E to the S2 is negative three. So we get a negative three T here. And now we need to find um, A1 and A2. So this is kind of like step two here. We need to find A1 and A2. And these come from the initial conditions, okay? Which we have some practice solving for. We did this at the beginning of um, this chapter, this lesson. So um, one of them is that I of zero, we've already been told that I of zero, the current through the inductor and in which is the current through the whole thing is equal to zero. So that's actually one of them that we already have. The other one that we have is that VC of zero is equal to five volts, okay? Um, <clears throat> now, as you'll see, what we're gonna need here is di dt at t equals zero. You'll see why that helps us find both A1 and A2 shortly. Um, and um, we'll go and find that on the uh, next slide here. Let's see here. Uh, here we go. Um, so, um, <clears throat> di dt um, at t equals zero. Well, we know that VL is equal to um, L di dt. And if we rearrange that, remember we've done this before, if we solve for di dt at t equals zero, that's gonna be equal to the voltage on the inductor at zero um, divided by the inductance. Okay, so then let's let's analyze what's going on at t equals zero. Okay, we've got the resistor, we've got the inductor, and we've got the capacitor at t equals zero. Um, so here's R, L, and C. Um, we want to find out. Um, We'd like to know what VL is, VL of zero is across the inductor. Um, we know that VC of zero is equal to five volts. That's great. So we can actually do, and we also know that there's no current through the resistor, um, that this is zero because the, we've been told that IL of zero the, the initial current through the inductor is zero. So by KVL, if we sum the voltages around the loop, we actually have then if there's zero current through the inductor, then, uh, then there's zero current through the resistor and VR of zero is then just nothing because there's no current flowing through it. So by summing voltages around the loop, we find that VL of zero is equal to um, a negative VC of zero, um, or that VL at time t equals zero, VL is equal to negative five volts. All right, so then di dt, we're almost done with this uh, problem, folks. So I'm just going to finish this out and then we'll, then we'll, we'll wrap for today, uh, is equal to VL of zero over L, which is negative five volts over one Henry, which is negative five amps per second. Okay, um, almost through here. So I of T, okay, remember we're looking for A1 and A2, right? It's, it's A1 E to the minus T plus A2 E to the minus three T. We found that on the last slide. Um, here's how we can find A1 and A2. We're going to get two equations and two unknowns. And the equations come from I of zero and di dt at zero. Um, so I of zero, if you plug in zero for t, remember e to the zero is one, right? So e to the minus zero is, is one, e to the minus three zero is one. So we get I of zero is equal to a one plus a two. Aha, nice and easy formula. 
And we in fact know that that is zero. We've been told that in the problem that I L of zero is nothing at time t equals zero. So that's our first equation. Our second equation comes from looking at the derivative of the function. Um, so let's just look at that in general, and then we'll look at it at time t equals zero. So if we take the derivative of i of t, a1 e to the minus t is going to be an, a negative a1 e to the minus t. And the derivative of a2 e to the minus 3t is a negative 3a2 e to the minus 3t. Um, and so if we then evaluate that at 0, so di dt at t equals 0, um, we're getting that this is a minus a1. Uh, so if you plug in 0 again for, for t, that just turns into a minus a1 and a minus 3a2 is all equal to, well, what is it equal to? We just found what it's equal to. Um, but we found di dt at time 0. And that's minus 5 amps per second. And that's the second equation. Um, so there's, you know, that's a pretty simple set of equations. A1 plus A2 is 0. Negative A1 minus 3A2 is negative 5. A uh, bunch of different ways you could solve such a system. One of the simplest is just to take equation 1 and add it to equation 2. And what you'll end up getting is that A1 is equal to negative 5 halves and a2 is equal to positive 5 halves. OK, um, so we now have the solution. i of t is um, negative, what is this? It's, oh boy, raised a lot more than I wanted. i of t is um, a1 is negative 5 halves e to the minus t. And a2 is a plus 5 halves e to the minus 3t. OK, um, <clears throat> if you wanted to look at what that function looks like, way you could draw it is um, as follows. This would be something like this. Um, let's just go ahead and draw that this is 5 halves, positive 5 halves up here, negative 5 halves up here. OK, um, <clears throat> the positive 5 halves is, uh, is, is the is the second term. This is this term here. Now that's going to decay at e to the minus 3t. That decays pretty quickly, something like that. It's going to decay more quickly than the negative 5 halves term, which is here, which is only decaying at the rate of e to the minus t, not e to the minus 3t. Um, so this is going to decay slower, like this, something like that. OK, um, and when you add those two things together, uh, this is going to kind of uh, remember, you're just adding the values here. Uh, this is going to dip down for a little bit here and then come back up. And then eventually exponentially or asymptotically approach uh, zero. And that is I of T. OK, so that finishes up um, our first example. Um, when we meet next time, we'll look at the, uh, the, the source free parallel RLC circuit, look at how it's different than the series RLC circuit, and we'll jump straight into doing some example problems. So we'll get through um, a number of example problems next session. Um, that concludes our second lesson on second order systems. So um, I wish you a nice weekend and we'll pick up the conversation next time. Until then.